Okay, so um, thank you. I mean, so if if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. That's what the government tells us, isn't it? Um, I think the idea of the day is to first tell us what we've got to fear, and then tell us how we might respond uh, in a more creative way than just fearfully. Um, from the kind of data gathering and data mining that um, goes on in every walk of life. I work in higher education, obviously, and you know everything is datafied. Everything's audited, metrics to measure every aspect of um, life that you can think of. So we've got um, a very kind of uh, interesting and kind of hybrid panel, I think, um, today. It's a kind of hybrid artist and academic response, sometimes hybrid artist academics indeed. Um, so we're going to start um, with Nick Tandavand... Sorry, I messed that up. Tandavandich, um, who's an artist with Blast Theory, which is a kind of pioneering artist group in the area of... Um, I should say multimedia interactive art. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we'll hear from Anna Dimitriou, um, who is an artist, an artist in residence at various places, University of Oxford being one of them. So again, a kind of hybrid artist academic. And then uh, we have Maria Subati. <coughs> Um, from the University of Brighton, where she teaches in the School of Art, Design and Media. Uh, and then, on my immediate right here, Dr. Perry Keller, who's reader in Media and Information Law at King's College, London. And finally, we have a joint presentation from Emily Giles, who is uh, Head of Outreach at uh, Co-Design and also writing a PhD, I believe. Yes. Um, <laughs> And uh, she's co-presenting co with Alan, Alan Waldock, who's the design lead at the Future Cities Catapult. So a really varied and interesting uh, <coughs> to help us think about these issues. And we'll start off with Nick. Over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to try and make my slideshow bigger. Uh, okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Nick, I um, work with an arts group called Blast Theory, and we've been going for about 20 years, um, well actually 24 years, um, and for about the last 15 years, um, we've been making a whole series of works that are focused on the impact of, um, I suppose, sort of mobile culture as a, as a space for uh, making artwork or making performance work. We started out making promenade performance. Okay. Um, yeah, we started making promenade performance in the early 90s, and around 2000 we started making work which was much more distributed, which took um, performance outside of, out of um, traditional theatre spaces and black box spaces, and looked at making work um, in the city or in virtual spaces, looking at online as a performance space, and looking at mobile technology as an as a enabling technology for performance in the city. Um, so I'm here today to talk uh, about one particular experience that we've had in making work um, around data. Um, so I'm not sure I quite fit into the schedule for the day because it's more a response to data, but it kind of follows up on particular interests that we had through various projects. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think hopefully it still stands as being useful to talk about now. So the project I want to talk about is is an app. It's called Karen, uh, and we released it this year in April. Um, and the starting point for the project was really um, a, a, a TV series. Uh, it was Adam Curtis's documentary called the Century of the Self, which is a history of the use of Freud within um, areas like marketing and in policy making. Um, and the, the increasing growth of psychology within different fields within within commerce and within politics um, and one of the sort of intriguing um, anecdotes he tells during that um, series is he talks about Clinton's re-election campaign um, and in the course of the campaign um, they changed tack in in terms of how they were going to approach uh, winning the election 
So they focused entirely their sort of policy making and their um, campaign on a, a small subsection of voters, the swing voters, in a number of states. Uh, and they came up with this system called VALS, called Va- which is an acronym short for Values and Lifestyles, which characterized uh, voters <coughs> along different um, social stratifications. Um, and they then modeled what they thought were their fears or their, um, their desires and their wishes. Uh, they used those to model uh, a series of, they called them, I think, is it retail policies? I, can't, I don't know the exact phrase for it, but policies which are essentially uh, designed to appeal to a very particular kind of voter. So it included things like installing um, uh, set-top boxes in every home to block the, um, violent television, or uh, there, were, there were all sorts of things which were entirely fabricated and not even plausible, um, but they were designed just to appeal to a particular set of anxieties of people in these um, stratified groups. Um, so the other thing um, which kind of came up through this documentary is, has really been the refinement of the model of um, personality that's happened over the, l- the last hundred years or so. Um, uh, and um, I think Richard Wiseman, who's um, wrote a really interesting book called 59 Seconds, which is a, um, a kind of change your life book, but it's, it's a kind of self-help book, but all of the exercise in it are kind of peer-reviewed, based on peer-reviewed journal uh, articles, so it's actually um, kind of useful, potentially. Um, he, he he suggests that um, with current models of personality, that um, you can actually come up with a, a reasonable uh, um, approximation of someone's personality based on just asking seven questions. Um, but um, some of the standard models uh, uh, that we've been interested in recently, uh, one's called OCEAN, which is an acronym for five dimensions of personality, <coughs> which are openness, conscientiousness extrovertedness, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Uh, and then Myers-Briggs, which is, and there, there's loads of tests online, so if you ever want to test yourself and find out how, you're, how you fare in these models of personality, they're, they're things that you can do online. So w- one other reference point for, for Karen was, um, was, which also similarly came from um, Adam Curtis uh, is um, the Experian database. Uh, this was an app that was around about two or three years ago called Mosaic, uh, and it gave you free access to look up any postcode in the UK. And it comes up with all sorts of bizarre sort of uh, word clouds of what the person who lives in a given postcode appears like. So uh, the one on the right is actually my home postcode, by the way. So I am a, a side street single. It is. Um, but in the course of working on Karen, we found that actually um, models of personality are, are sort of fallen out of favour somewhat with um, commerce and with um, politics. And people are actually looking much more around behaviour these days. And so they're not looking at personality as a static thing, but as essentially... Um, looking at what you do based on your activities and I guess it's very much in the class of the the kind of dumb the dumb science of big data where Google thinks it can predict sort of outbreaks of um, various kinds of illness based on what people are searching on it on its search engine but it's not actually to do with a, a connectedness with understanding the principles of what's going on it's just to do with correlating two separate kind of events. But it's very much along those lines that behavioural profiling seems to be working. <coughs> um. So w- one other reference point I wanted to bring up before talking about Karen is an earlier project. So this is from 2005. It was a project called uh, Prof Tander's Guess Aware. Um. And Prof Dander was actually uh, a character that was me. Um. So it was, uh, it was kind of in advance of, um, I guess, smartphones. So it was running on a Nokia Series 40 phone. Um, and it was designed in the context of a research project where we were trying to um, encourage people to monitor their own uh, 
um, energy use. So it was a, an environmental science project. And it was looking at mobile devices as a kind of data gathering um, platform for people to actually contribute to a kind of larger science project, which included monitoring their own electricity use and their own water use. Um, so the structure was that um, Prof Tanda was a, a small sort of app which um, alerted you once or twice a day, and that would be based on um, what you told Prof Tanda already, or your location, or uh, um, I guess uh, what the time of day was. And so it would go through uh, a number of sessions. I think in total it, the, the project ran for about 10 days and there were two sessions a day. Uh, and, each, and each session was structured around a series of multiple choice dialogues. Uh, and each multiple choice dialogue started with some kind of context finding. So the app would kind of know, or it would think it would know uh, if you're at home or not, but it would always do a confirmation whether you're at home or not. And then based on your context and the time of day and what you told it about your circumstances, it would um, then give you a task or give you a quiz that would then relate to some activity in terms of data gathering. But it was all fronted by a character called Prof Tanda. Um, so at the time, um, we were kind of curious about um, really how much you could learn about people's context based on mobile devices. Um, and that was one of the, the key things for this project was really, can we ask people to measure their own domestic electricity usage um, in a sensible way that isn't annoying because um, we know enough about their context to actually make that activity a plausible thing, a plausible ask. So we know that they have the time to do it. We know that they're in the right place to do it. We know that, that previously they've expressed an interest in doing it. So there's a whole di set of different factors in play. Um, and at the time, we one of the reference points was an early project into looking at mobile devices as a form of um, building it, pictures of people's patterns of behavior. And was this paper called um, Reality Mining, which was from MIT in, I think, about 2005? Oh, yeah, 2005. <coughs> um, So at the time, this is kind of pre-GPS in smartphones. So we were doing location-based sensing using cell tower visualization. So we w were mapping out the courses of people's days based on the, the, the cell towers that their mobile phones were linked to. Um, so jump forward uh, 10 years, or jump, yeah, forward 10 years. Um, we we went ahead uh, and made uh, a project called Karen. So Karen was informed, I guess, a lot about a lot, of, based on a lot of these ideas around context finding, about working out what someone is doing, trying to sort of delve into their lives, but also looking at psychometric profiling and looking at ways that you can use psychometric profiling to get a handle on engaging someone. In, like one of the kind of key. I suppose uses of, of psychometric profiling in, in marketing is, is really just a, a way to get a handle on, is to find leverage with people, to find leverage in being able to manipulate them or to find ways of um, engaging them. And so as artists, we thought, we want to do this. Um, but, and uh, yeah. And so um, we designed Karen. So Karen is an app which is structured as a series of conversations with a character called Karen. Um, and the interface um, sets itself up as being a series of FaceTime calls with a real person. So when you open the app, it suggests that it's calling Karen and you're actually going to be having a FaceTime session with someone in real time on the other end of the, the phone. But in actuality, all of the Karen sessions are pre-recorded, all the videos downloaded in the background when you first um, download the app. Um, and the form of interaction is based on a series of um, multiple choice in text interactions. So each time you call Karen over the course of about 10 days, um, you'll catch her at different points in her daily life. So she'll be um, setting up um, 
eating her breakfast at weird times of the day, sometimes, um, <laughs> preparing to go out. Um, but the premise is that she is setting herself up as a life coach, and each of these video calls with her is actually a way that she's going to help you through uh, finding what's wrong with your life and changing your life. <coughs> um, And over the course of 10 days, um, you find that her concern with you is actually quite limited. She asks you a lot about yourself, but you f realize that you, you find out more about her and you, you, you become to be aware about her life and things that are falling apart in her life. So her private life starts leaking into the, um, what's intended to be professional life coaching sessions. At the end of the 10 days, um, you kind of realize that you've actually just become a kind of pawn in the drama, which is kind of an ongoing story that is Karen's, Karen's own life rather than you. But what we've done is use the data that we've gathered about your personality, about um, the things that you've told her. They, I, they're leveraged by Karen herself to change the way that she then behaves to you in the story, to try and bring you into her story. So the idea of the app is that you become an actor in this kind of drama, which is her life, even though that isn't the intention that, you've, that we'd explicitly given as to why you'd be taking part at the very beginning. Um, and at the very end, you, uh, we then feed back to you some of the data that you gave us. So the app is really in two parts. One is the, the kind of drama that you have over a period of 10 days interacting with Karen. And then the second part is uh, a, a data report. And that takes, I think, six of about 30 psychometric scales that we measure you on over the course of the, the, um, the interaction. And that talks about how you scored on those scales, how you compared to other people. Um, but also it talks about where those scales have been applied and where they've been used in other contexts. So their uses in marketing and their uses in recruitment and in commerce. Okay. Um, so I guess I should sort of wrap up there. But one thing I just wanted to say was, I guess, in terms of this kind of journey uh, of us working with data is, um, was really for us, was a, a learning about the complexity of working with data and the whole, uh, the whole set of new skills that, that had to kind of come about through us working with data. So one is obviously we're holding a whole load of personal data now about people. We have 30 plus psychometric scales, um, about 15,000 people, which is the number of kind of downloads for, for the app. Um, but it's also been a really interesting process where it feels like it's re-establishing a potential relationship with an audience. It's a new opportunity <coughs> for us um, with, with, I suppose, many um, I suppose, uh, conditions about actually how we use that data.
Well, um, yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to struggle through this antiquated PC system to uh, give a talk on my work. Um, I think when you introduced me, you said something like sort of an academic. I definitely wouldn't class myself as one of those. I have no interest in that side of the world, really. What I have been described <laughs> as <laughs> is, is an undercover agent. Some people have said that. So I sort of... Um, kind of managed to infiltrate myself into certain worlds um, and uh, at some point I sort of get pulled out again and report back to other people about them and that's uh, I think that's what I'm doing. So what I've done recently is I've been investigating whole genome sequencing of bacteria. I'm obsessed with bacteria. For those of you who know me, who've met me before, you know I spend most of my time thinking about and working with bacteria. Um, I, what I've recently have started to do is a project called Sequence, um, which is to explore the implications of whole genome sequencing of bacteria and what this will mean for us. It's a new technology, um, well, relatively new technology, which means that whereas you used to have old diagnostic tests for bacteria, they'd sort of grow them on a Petri dish and do some little chemical tests on them, and this would take around, you know, three days or so to get an answer back, and it would tell you something about the bacteria. You might then do some tests to see with little discs and things to see if antibiotics would be effective on those bacteria, and that would take another 24 hours to grow. So it took a quite a long time to get people diagnosed um, with illnesses, which is, I'm sure, something you've all experienced when you've had a, you know, sore throat or something, gone to the doctors, and they say, well, try these antibiotics, um, because it would take too long to actually test you for this and if they don't work it's a process where you keep going back keep going back and this exacerbates a situation called antimicrobial resistance where a lot of the bacteria that we commonly get infected by are developing massive amounts of drug resistance now due to the exposure of antibiotics that they have um, so I've been working with scientists at Oxford University and Public Health England to um, to find out what they're doing about this and what the plan is, is to use this relatively new technology of whole genome sequencing. So it stems from the um, Human Genome Project, and um, you can imagine the human genome is very big. Bacterial genomes are quite a bit smaller, so you can sequence them relatively quickly, and you can sequence a bacterial genome now in less than 24 hours, and that means that you can tell everything about that bacterium. So you know exactly what drug resistances it has, and you can also see um, and this is where you get into the interesting privacy things, um, literally who gave it to who, because there are minor base, cha base pair changes in the <coughs> genome of the bacteria, so for instance the Staph aureus from my body um, has 2.4 million base pairs and you could, we could have a look at Alex who's in the back of the room there and he's probably carrying a very similar strain to me, we haven't sequenced the genome of his factor but we spend a lot of time together so we'll have slightly different but you'll be able to see that he caught it from me or, or and vice versa, other people that I meet and uh, come across. So um, I wanted to look at the um, issues behind the research and the history behind the work and to create an installation which basically kind of communicates the idea of it because I think it's really important uh, for us to understand this. It's going to be implemented in the UK Health Service. They're trialling it now in quite a few centres in the UK, in Oxford, Birmingham, Brighton um, and Leeds. And um, it'll be implemented hopefully in the next five years. So instead of the traditional tests, the commonly available test will be this whole genome sequencing, which will hopefully help kind of reduce things like antimicrobial resistance because they'll know exactly what antibiotics to treat a bacterium with. Um, this project, rather bizarrely, is all funded by the Arts Council as well, not science funding. Um, so this um, was an earlier work that I made which is called the MRSA quilt. These are some of the experiments and you can see the, some of the classical sort of tests. So this is using a textile but the blue on here is MRSA or MRSA bacteria, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it. Um, the little white polka dots on there, um, the little discs, they're these uh, antibiotic susceptibility discs. So it takes like a day for the bacteria to decide whether they will grow up to them or not. And if they, if they avoid
treat them like these ones, then they're um, then those antibiotics are uh, effective. So these are vancomycin discs, and this is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a common skin bacterium that's developed this really rather nasty drug resistance that means it's targeted to a particular ecological niche, which is sick people in hospitals who are having kind of invasive lines and things going into them because it produces these very good biofilms which allow it to travel along instruments and things. But for a normal, healthy person, it's not so much of a problem. It's less less dangerous to us than a normal Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, that's the sort of results the quilt's currently on show in uh, Seoul at the moment at the Science Museum there. Um, so, yeah, I carry two different strains of Staphylococcus aureus in my nose, um, and that's me looking quite happy there, um, holding them. Now, microbiologists I work with sometimes say, this is a bit frightening, you've got your hair all hanging down and everything, you've not got proper sort of lab gear on, but this is my bacteria, so I can't really get sick from it, it's already all over me. Um, so, um, yeah, we were sort of debating whether I needed to even be wearing a lab coat for the picture, but it was quite aesthetically pleasing. So, I've, um, I've cultured these um, Staph aureus that live in my body. Like I said, about 30% of the population carry Staph aureus at the moment on them. It's a normal bacterium, but it can cause disease, it can kill you. Um, it depends. We don't know why. Sometimes it, it's in one part of the body, it might get into a different part of the body and it completely change its behaviour and turn on you. But apart from that, it's, it's kind of part of our normal skin flora. Um, so I decided I wanted to understand this technology they were doing. It took me a long time to pluck up the courage to do this. It's a very complicated subject area. And I decided that I would learn the entire process from end to end. Um, most of it comprises doing this, pipetting, that to really fine detail in that you have these tiny little things called flow cells which you can see downstairs in the exhibition in the Riverside Gallery um, and one of those tiny little flow cells has a million fragments of DNA per millimetre and if you have too many or too few on the flow cell um, then it doesn't work so you have to be very precise about this so it's, you um, extract the DNA from the bacteria and you, you purify it and um, you dilute it so you have this exactly perfect kind of amount um, which is hugely complicated and I was looking at as well how to kind of use hacker processes in that and DIY technologies and how much you could replace rather than using these very expensive um, technologies with what you could replace as well. The price of whole genome sequencing has come right down. It's um, it's about fifty pounds to sequence the, a bacterial genome now. So, considering it replaces all the other tests needed, you can see that it's going to be quite cost effective to implement it. Um, so, um, the first outcome from the project we did, um, I. I've made a dress which is actually impregnated in the same way as the quilt, but with the Staphylococcus aureus from my body and also with uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and the really nasty one, the one that if you get in your hospital you're terrified, vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So that's resistant to the last ditch antibiotic. Um, I sterilise everything before I put it into galleries, so don't worry about my work. Um, too much uh, and uh, behind it is the um, being projected so on on the dress is the light output of a whole genome sequencer and actually they work with light um, and they work with um, by kind of lighting up different fluorophores which attach to the DNA strands in it and taking thousands well millions of photographs of the bacteria and slicing kind of through it um, to build up and understand, you know, the A, T, G, Cs and things like that. So the actual whole assembled genome, which I, I assembled on my on my MacBook Air, uh, it took 14 hours to assemble the genome for, that I produced from the data. So it just gives you an idea of how, how much data we're kind of dealing with. And if we're dealing with all the data of all the people coming into the healthcare system, there's masses of data. Um, but that's projected behind it, the actual data output. And on, projected onto the dress is the light output of the sequencer. So as, it's almost as if you're inside the sequencer. Another project that I've done is using, um, to create interactive works with Alex May, um, that, use, um, that use DIY techniques to um, look at different 
bacteria growing and then create interactive works which reveal kind of a sort of a create a virtual petri dish so they reveal to people their own or what might be their own microbiome it's actually our microbiome um, but it, it's kind of very complicated database of different bacterial colonies growing in high definition and we've created a few pieces using this and we've used it in the virtual reality experience um, that you'll be able to see later at four o'clock um, that's another example of the light output of the sequencer and um, that was part of a bacteria light lab at the welcome collection in london um, we've also done some practical DNA extraction workshops. I was working with Nicola Fawcett from um, the Modernising Medical Microbiology Project and we were explaining to them just not DNA from people's own bodies or from their bacteria because this gets into a level of complexity you can't just do in a museum. You need to bring people into a laboratory and you need quite a bit of technology for that. But we were extracting DNA from um, things like kiwi fruit but then also showing people how to kind of purify that to an extent and to pellet it and to centrifuge it and things. Um, then um, there was an installation with the virtual reality at the VNA where basically you can enter into an experience of what it's like to be inside the sequencer um, and kind of hear a story about what's going on there from start to finish. Um, of the process. Um, so it'll be on at um, four till six, you can have a go. There's some little screenshots of what it's like inside. So it's, it's yeah, it's quite intriguing. People had some interesting reports on how they felt about it. Somebody said they found it enormously comforting, if that's um, sort of makes you want to do it. I don't know, <laughs> it's quite a nice idea. Um, but. This is just one bacterium that lives on my body. I found out it's got three different drug resistances. So it's resistant to penicillin, fluoroquinolones, um, ciprofloxacin. It was, it was multi-drug resistant. Um, it's just an average everyday one. And that's just one bacteria that lives in the front of my nose. You've probably got similar ones, but that's just one. There are billions of different kinds of bacteria on us. Um, at least two kilos of our body weight of bacteria. Um, there are more bacterial cells uh, in the human body than there are human cells. Mm -hmm. Not ten times. People always quote that. It's not true. Um, but we've got this thing. We've got this gut microbiome. You know, we've got two kilos of all these di diverse ecosystems living in us, and they're talking about using them as kind of, uh, of almost like for crime scene investigation things, how do we share our microbiome? They were talking about it possibly as um, like for rape cases, they might check people's um, um, sort of genital microflora and see if they'd shared different bacteria and that might be, a, that might in the future, they've been suggesting that that might be a way that they could investigate crimes. The scientists I work with say that this would be at this stage to actually test this would be um, very negative to the technology because at the moment you sort of when you come up with data results you kind of would say well you've sort of got a million to one chance of that occurring again but you could easily disprove in a court of law a million to one chance when there are you know 60 million living in the UK or something like that so um, it's it's an interesting area you can like you literally you could sort of if there was an outbreak here we could see who caused it and by kind of inference, work out that we all caught it at the um, at the uh, networked bodies symposium by looking at the data, um, and we, then you know we can get into the level where we can hack our um, microflora and change ourselves anyway. So um, I was working with the UCL iGEM team and Heather McLean at Sussex University, and we um, we extended a project that I made earlier called the Hypersymbiont Enhancement Salon. And these um, this um, these products that I made, they're um, a food supplement, freeze-dried food supplement, a lipstick and some jellies um, that you can eat um, <laughs> if you want to. I wouldn't. <laughs> um, they contain the, um, they contain a, back, it's a, it's a probiotic E. coli, but the E. coli has been hacked so it contains um, a serotonin um, producing um, plasmid, it's got a serotonin producing plasmid in its genome. So if you take it, if you eat it, then in theory, via the vagus nerve, it might possibly cross, um, cross into your brain and make you happy, is the hypothesis. So they've, they've um, worked and created this, um, 
this fact here and they asked me to kind of develop it with them because it fitted into other stuff that I've done. So, act, I mean, actually there's some drawbacks with it. It has to be grown at the moment on um, chloramphenicol um, agar. So, although the agar, agar could generally be edible, and we do take chloramphenicol, um, you probably wouldn't want to take it unnecessarily. Though, if you did take the food supplement and you were on chlor chloramphenicol, which is an antibiotic for a disease, then it might proliferate in your gut um, and might be effective. So we have to be quite careful with these GMOs that they don't get outside the lab, obviously. So uh, <laughs> just, or, <laughs> apart from in America, where you can just show them quite easily. And the last slide um, is that I'm currently doing a synthetic biology residency at the University of California, where they're working on ways that you can try to stop genetically modified organisms getting outside of the lab and they're looking at something called XNA which is um, a non-natural nucleic acid so it if it did get out of the lab into it, it and it was outside it could never get into a natural organism because it wouldn't know what to do with the code it wouldn't have the tools to process it is the theory so um, you can ask me about that later if you want to and that's the end thank you start by reading it and see how it goes. Um, and to go back to the presentation, to the introduction by Phil, um, I'm going to talk something about uh, something that we, uh, we fear and we learn that we need to hide. So I'm going to talk something about uh, uh, that's constantly about a constantly growing a group of data subjects and objects that's older people in our aging society. And um, older age has been something that I had uh, been uh, fearing since I can remember myself. Um, I'm an older woman now, so I'm, I'm much relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. And um, older age is what I have been experiencing since I was born. And uh, aging is what I do all the time, so um, all the time. So it is a constantly increasing trend, as is technological innovation and uh, the use of uh, media. So I want to introduce some questions on age, older people, data, and digital. Uh, I want to start by asking how we are um, um, inviting us to, to think about how we think about older age and older people, uh, how we collect data about older age and older people, how we interface older people and new technology, and maybe hopefully in the discussion we can, we can continue with how uh, we, we reconstitute the old through data analysis. Uh, interpretation, uh, correlations, etc. Wrong arrow. Yes. So we commonly think about older people as those over a certain age, and um, we tend to think of this age as those over 55, uh, which is uh, which includes it's a huge group, of course, of abstracted individuals. It includes uh, five different decades of birth dates, and three different generations of uh, people, at least. Yeah. So we conceptualize age as chronology and older, a, older age as a, a homogeneous group of uh, people generalized from middle age to, to high age. And um, 
conventionally, when we talk about new technologies, we think about them uh, about age in binary terms more so than we think about other aspects of our life. So we juxtapose the, the, the old to the young. Uh, we think of age as a binary, and we represent uh, um, it as a binary. So, and of course. Um, Biological age must be looked at in connection with uh, uh, with a lot of things, with a specific person's interest, ability, social and economic resources, among other stuff, about uh, uh, other factors, and the variation between older people, as we all learn as we age, is greater than this between younger people. So we, we talk about this as age heterogeneity. Our differences tend to grow as we age. So these are some randomly chosen pictures from my uh, Facebook page. Some of those people I know, I don't know this, this guy, he's a famous philosopher and, uh, and uh, psychologist. I know uh, this older guy and the younger one. Um, and um, So um, our societies are waking up to the problem of aging, as uh, we know. And um, it has been going on for, uh, well, over three decades at the level of policy making and uh, economic advisors. And global government and economic policy advisors have been framing ageing since the late 1990s as an as, um, accounting problem and as, a, as an international financial policy issue. That's how it started being thought of in policy terms. And, and here we have, um, I found this, um, this table, these figures from the House of Commons. This, this shows the trends in ageing. Uh, in uh, a number of uh, developed economies. Um, so the, the dark green color is uh, the percentage of the population aged over 65 uh, in uh, 2050. It's growing, so we, we, we become more, more and more of us. And um, so we started thinking about aging as, as, as an economic problem. Um, since the late 1990s, um, and with concerns over the sustainability of the welfare state, you know, inherited care, uh, care provision institutions, pay-as-you-go systems that you cannot maintain. Now we, we, we used to, these are part of our everyday reality, of course, uh, as part of the dismantling of uh, the institutions of the 20th century um, uh, welfare state and, uh, and among other things. So a new vocabularies around ageing have entered our everyday language. First, um, the term successful ageing was proposed in the States, um, um, United States um, in the late 90s. Um, in the year 2002, 2002, the World Health Organization proposed the term um, active aging to describe uh, the optimizing of uh, health, participation, uh, security, and enhanced quality of life. This is the term that this is the preferred term to to describe our desired future um, among the European Union uh, member states. Um, so we want to have uh, populations that age actively, and this is how I would, uh, I would like to discuss this at the end of pres uh, this presentation as well. This is what I call retroactive aging, information we collect about one's life and what we do about it. Um, going back to, the, to our biology and wh what we do to our bodies, uh, as well as what we do to our bodies. So going back to the terminology, um, and within the European Union, uh, the aim now is to reap the benefits of the silver economy as a consumer economy, as well as an opportunity for design, um, uh, architecture, uh, technology design, and so forth. So that's the policy context, but we need data for that, of course. Uh, policies for an aging population require new bodies of data to make aging governable. And so we need to find out more about our present and future. Um, in order to establish the social relations of an age-friendly society. How do we find out, find out about uh, older people? Uh, through data generation, and we do that throughout our lives, yes, when we interact with systems. Sorry. And uh, data, as we know, as uh, social, and are a collective accomplishment. And here I, I, I borrow from uh, Rupert et al., their work on, on, on the social data. Um, without connections between people and technologies, data would not um, uh, exist. Uh, so we, we, at some point you do use technologies to, to visualize this, this beautiful stuff that um, um, bacteria, for example, look like. Um, 
it's not just technology, but we, you need that. Um, so it's through such connections that we map needs, abilities, the prospects for a healthy and active aging, yes. It's through this connection that we use, for example, tracking technologies, um, information about um, transport, who uses transport in so-and-so city, to, to map various groups of populations uh, in need. Um, something else about older age, as we know, um, is that the of ad advancing of age comes with a reduction of space for action. Eventually, people of a high age, um, the oldest old, experience both a reduction of uh, uh, our functioning and mobility and a reduction of the space we are allowed to move within. So we're being enclosed in safe spaces, okay? Eventually in societies like ours, uh, the nursing home, yeah? And those spaces will increasingly be connected um, uh, and digitalized and smart. So access to support service, for example, will be is started is, is, is today via interfaces such as screens, wearables, uh, tracking, communication systems. So, and, and use of those technologies uh, for safety, <coughs> security, and care, one way or the other, generates data, and is uh, by intention also as a byproduct about surveillance um, relationships. Care is about surveillance and care uh, is 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 a. Uh, uh, a default, maybe, relationship. So in order to introduce problematics of, um, of digital bodies in government and of ageism, that is my background interest uh, and sensitivity, um, and this is why I, I found this as a great opportunity to, to just invite us to think about how we think about age. Um, I will use uh, two examples of care by design that we are very familiar with. One is the government digital services. Um, well, I, I suppose most of us know about that so-called digital by default public service provision. So the aim has been um, in government to provide all information about uh, government services, information-based government services and welfare services in digital form only. In other words, when you need to um, get advice, um, information about, this includes, you know, information about healthcare services. So I'm going to use an example of how we interface all the people uh, in healthcare um, websites uh, run by local authorities. And the other one will be about an example of a, of a good looking interface. Uh, and I want us to, to think about, you know, the, the, the ideas about the old we bring into that. Okay, so um, the first um, is from a study I, I did last year, um, 18 months ago, that examined how older people are represented visually in local authority websites uh, providing healthcare information. So I looked at the 12 inner city uh, London uh, boroughs, which are, among other things, racially very diverse. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, found that, uh, you know, uh, unsurprisingly perhaps, uh, because we tend to not think about it, we don't like seeing older people on our screens. Um, so, um, uh, so two general trends in the websites were A, that older people, there was a limited visibility, uh, not a lot of images depicting older adults, by contrast to the websites about services for younger people, full of pictures, colorful. Mm -hmm. And two, lack of diversity. Typically, we tend to think of the older person as the frail, older, white lady, with a lot of ageist um, values here. So this is the, um, the legacy website of the Royal Borough of Greenwich. And in the page, they had two pictures, one of the, in the page for healthcare services, one of an older lady and one of a fruit salad. <laughs> so this. This is one source compared with the page for younger people. I'm not going to go into that. The other example is of, uh, of a beautifully looking uh, interface, a thermostat, uh, that um, a group of fantastic designers uh, from uh, um, San Francisco has produced. So this is a thermostat that uh, British Gas is hoping to, to sell to 16 million households. And um, so... Um, this was brought to my attention from a visually literate friend, a very talented uh, woman who is uh, an editor in a photography journal. 
um, who said, Maria, look at that. This is not only ageist, but also sexist. So here is um, uh, the, the, the lead designer, and I have a link to the video uh, of the whole team, you know, uh, talking about the project. Oh, he, the, the lead designer talks about the project, and the whole team is at the background, you know, um, standing. Uh, and he mentions that, yes, indeed, their values were that, you know, um, uh, the, the way this was built was that they didn't want to add another screen in the home. Um, the way they wanted to bring design um, technology into the homes was, you know, not not uh, using the assumptions that are um, mobilized um, to build stuff for younger people and the Internet of Things. But you know, um, this is um, um, this is a product that uh, is going to be used for, by any everyone from your grandma to your auntie. Auntie, yeah. So, um, and this is an inclusive, I mean, this is an accessible design, but the, the way we talk about, yes, um, obviously thinking has been made in order to be put into the design of that in order to be accessible, uh, but the way we refer um, to uh, the people yes. uh, that we make it accessible for, we still don't have, you know, don't know how to talk about them. Um, so the last thing I want to mention before I uh, conclude this is the, um, the active aging um, value. We're going to hear more and more about that. Uh, this has been proposed that we had reports um, since the, uh, 12 months now. The last one was by the World Health Organization uh, three weeks ago published. Um, so uh, the active aging uh, is, um, as I said, is, 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 is what we need to aim for, is all the people who are able to participate in the economy, not cost much, yeah, in, in to, 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 the, to the state, uh, and, um, um, but, but the question is how we define that, how we measure that, and how we find out about that. So to give us an example, I will read um, a paragraph uh, from a report, uh, a background research report for the European uh, um, Commission uh, that talks about the main determinants of well-being among the elderly reveal in general that the situation uh, in the last stage of life is dependent on a whole life course. Having children and living in a relationship, having human capital investments, health status and participation in labour force positively positively affect economic well-being and life satisfaction. These factors also allow to identify fragile groups, people in poor health, living alone, childless people, uh, people without kinship networks and persons not engaged in any social or leisure activity. So, yes. Uh, in other words, information and data about life choices that may not fit certain 20th century life course values are going to, to, to be useful to define us in the near future. Um, so that was my last slide, or do I have another one? Yes, the, the, the conclusion. I think we need to think both about age and about data. Uh, and I am one of those who, who believe in the, the movement that we need a sort of uh, data ethics of care. So uh, this will be one of the um, uh, discussions that I have begun and will continue, and I want to be part of this, uh, about the building uh, and embedding uh, in, in the thinking of all generations of a new understanding of aging and of data as social. And I hope we, 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 we may discuss more about that uh, later today. Thank you.
Uh, hi, uh, my name is Perry Keller. I uh, teach at the School of Law at King's College London. And uh, my area of interest is privacy and in particular data privacy. Um, so my first comment is, before we get carried away with the effectiveness of data, I did this on a Mac and this PC mm -hmm. has now changed the font to something <laughs> <laughs> quite uh, less uh, legible, but I hope you'll be able to read that as I go on. Okay, so in the brief amount of time I have, I'd like to persuade you that privacy is something we should be concerned about, and also that the law is something that involves you, and is something you ought to be thinking about in relation to your privacy. So the first thing to say is that, well, from uh, a legal view, what do we think of as privacy? And we begin with some very common notions of privacy, particularly in relation to information, and that's the, that privacy is about your autonomy, how you control your life, and therefore how you control your information. Um, and on that basis, there is a particular uh, term which is very important to the whole realm of data, and that's the term is personal data. Now, legal definitions are something that most people uh, begin to nod off very quickly about, but this one, personal data, is what everything turns around. Because if it is personal data, you have some control over it. If it's not regarded as personal data, it falls outside of this area of privacy law. So personal data begins with very easy things like our names and other things that distinguish us from other people. And those would include other things that don't need to be associated with your name. Could be the place you live, an address, then you're known as the single person at that address then it's your personal data, that address and the occupant, the car and the number plate that belongs to you and that becomes personal data. But as it turns out, and tying in with some of the other things that have been said, as technology moves along in its various applications, what we regard as personal data grows. So we now have uh, CCTV cameras with very uh, connected to very highly advanced facial recognition technologies so that you you can be identified uh, from even quite a fuzzy image of you on the street. We of course have other things like keystroke recognition so the pattern that you use on a keyboard is unique and that can be recorded and that will be known when you are using the laptop and not somebody else using the laptop. So that pattern becomes personal data <coughs> if it's in the hands of somebody who can use it to identify you. Indeed, it moves further on to areas that, for example, Anna's was dealing with is, and this is somewhat controversial from a legal term because there are aspects of actually body samples we can do it, term those legally to be personal <coughs> data. The actual sample that the police retain, not just of a DNA profile, the code, but the actual sample that they would take of a swab, that would be regarded as personal data. Say, so all of this is incredibly important because if it is personal data, then it connects that that individual potentially has a right to do something about it. So we can see that as all this technology is shifting and changing, and you can be identified in so many new and exciting and different ways, then that becomes your personal data. But as it expands, of course, you lose the ability to keep track yourself of all the ways in which you can be identified. <coughs> that you know, adds to the great challenge here. I'll say two other things before I start, and keeping in mind the time as well, and that is that um, the law does have a lot of problems in this area. Problems keeping up, uh, problems with the different interests that push the law as it develops one way or another, because there are, of course, very many uh, parties who are very interested in 
open and more access to our data. And so that the protection of privacy sometimes sounds like a minority interest. But nonetheless, there are many real consequences for anybody de who deals with data. So for example, a good friend of mine does uh, neuroscientific research at Cambridge. They put people into fMRI scanners and they create these visual images of their brain, the whole brain. It used to be they could pass these in thousands between different researchers. But now the technology is, of course, of facial recognition that you, even without the name, you can find out who that person is just by the image created by the F MRI. And so now they have to include a new technology that removes the face. Before it can be traded between different researchers, the law requires an expensive extra step. You have to remove the face. So this is a very small and practical example. It's not without an impact but it depends on a kind of constant vigilance and activity to make the law work. So I want to talk about privacy in the smart city, and I'll talk about smart cities a bit. Uh, I know that Alan knows a great deal more about smart cities than I do, but I started a project on privacy in smart cities earlier this year, and uh, it's gearing up to, we're going to do a lot of work on over, uh, over the next 12 months on uh, different access aspects of surveillance and privacy in what we could call a smart city. Um, one of the things about privacy in the city, of course, it depended historically on anonymity. That was the great thing about cities, was places that people could go and be unknown. Well, that era seems to be coming to an end. So we have to think about what it means to be private in an urban place in which you're no longer unknown. So smart cities, if you're not familiar with that term or that idea, is, a, is a, um, almost a bit of a marketing term, but it refers to a number of technologies that involve uh, basically the gathering of data, much of it personal data, and aggregating that data and involving, in many circumstances, use of big data uh, analytics uh, to just find, uh, to find out how various things are happening within the city uh, to improve the way the city works, that being one of the, the major goals. And so we can see that energy supplies like electricity can be distributed more effectively, waste disposal can be done more effectively, communication systems in the city can work better, transport, and finally, of course, public safety and security, which is on everyone's mind today. But I'm just going to uh, keep my, my references mostly about transport. Uh, it's an easy one to think about. If you think of all the ways you've got here, you know that I'm sure most of you know that TFL is uh, very effective in the gathering of information through Oyster cards, through all the other payment devices, and so that all journeys are mapped and included in some very important big data processes to, in their view, to make the systems work better. So it's either it's the overground or all the bus trips, all the individual bus trips, especially those that were done with Oyster cards or any uh, tap and click and pay mechanisms, all those are logged in the system. Uh, the Boris bikes, Santander, uh, all of those journeys are also included in the data. The vast amount of data coming together and one can see that these payment places are also data collection points. And sometimes they're much more important as data collection points at times than, than actual payment. But that gives a certain view of the uh, smart city which is about as if it's an apparatus in which you engage with it. But there's one other aspect that of course completes the smart city is that our phones, our laptops, everything else, all the apps we use, the Ubers, the city mappers, all of those are part of this greater thing we would call the smart city. All of them collecting data, all those taxi rides, all those places where you've clicked into a restaurant and clicked out for some particular app. That is, in the larger sense, part of this thing of the smart city. 
So the consequence is, of course, this loss of urban identity. And one of the interesting arguments uh, about this is that it's nothing new. Uh, historically, going back to medieval villages, or even many people would say <coughs> villages somewhere else that they know, virtually everything's known about you. But in the medieval village, everyone knew everything about you. The moment they saw you born, they saw all the stages of your life in intimate and gory detail on many occasions. And so the sense, the argument there is that this uh, feeling we have that our privacy is important and our anonymity in the city is important is simply a cultural development that will fade away and everyone will get used to it. The difficulty though is that in the medieval village those people who knew you were family, relatives, neighbors, you were seen in a context. And the question here becomes how is it that you are being manipulated or in what ways is your data being used in ways that you don't want it to be used either in terms of singling you out uh, to offer you particular services or make you a suspect for certain purposes. So it's a very different kind of knowledge than existed uh, historically or even in some small village in Cumbria where it would seem that most people know your business. So we have this vast amount of uh, surveillance going on in the city. It's often called ubiquitous. It's everywhere, the CCTV, the, all the different places it's picked up. And it's pervasive in the different forms it comes in. It's mass, so it gathers, wants to know what we're doing as groups, but also very, uh, the system is also important in times in finding out what particular individuals do. And it's collecting, of course, the physical, the psychological, and even the behavioral attributes. It's not just your name, but indeed it comes down to, as I was saying, the possibilities developing of what mood you are in the time. Because when you use your keystrokes on the laptop, they can tell, beginning to be able to have run programs, they can tell differences in mood as the same individual, but they're using their, their keystrokes in slightly different ways. Uh, there's an American academic, Julie Cohen, uh, and she's described this as the modulation of our lives. Why she says modulated, that's because it is simply not an external element where something's using data to try and manipulate us or coerce us, but actually, of course, we are interactively involved in it. All those apps you use, all those ways in which you give your data in exchange for particular services mm -hmm. means that the services themselves adapt themselves to you in many occasions. So she talks about, and I think it's a nice phrase, the modulation of our lives. Our choices become different because of how we're known. Now, in the time I have left, which isn't too much, I want to persuade you that uh, this is not all doom and gloom. There's something that can be done about this, that although we have to accept, we must accept that the apparent anonymity we have experienced with the urban life is rapidly failing and fading away and we will be living in a more open society in which is more transparent about ourselves but nonetheless that can be a very vibrant place to live if people are participate actively if it has a democratic character and people engage themselves to try and control those processes that they want to know what's happening with their data and be involved in decision making about their data. So this is from a legal perspective about asserting rights. Um, there's one very important area to look at, uh, that's data protection <coughs> rights. People come across this all the time, uh, but it is, uh, and perhaps over the last year especially, of some of the important decisions that have been made by the European Court of Justice on things like the right to be forgotten 
or most more recently the uh, annulment of the uh, of the decision uh, validating the exchange of information with the United States, something called the Safe Harbor Agreement, is having a, a big impact now uh, because of concerns about abuses of data. The basic things that one had to think about is that you cannot use somebody's data without consent or showing that it's necessary in very uh, fairly confined terms. But let's not to get carried away. Consent is all those times you're asked to look at the fine print, the privacy policy. How many actual times do you actually look at any of that or actually look to see what cookies are operating? So consent is so easily thrown away. Another aspect is purpose limitation. The data cannot seem, even your consent, it has to be consent for a purpose. It's not an open-ended harvesting of data. You ought to be aware of, all of us, for what purposes are we giving consent and when are those purposes um, coming to an end and the data should therefore be disposed of. So all of this is around issues of the rights we have, which are aspects around the transparency of data processing, access to it. So we have rights of correcting data and deleting it. And as you'll see at the end, very important things relating to the idea of the right to be forgotten. There's a very interesting idea is what happens in the future with this smart city and all that data about you that is being carefully uh, aggregated. To what extent can we begin to use the idea, for example, the right to be forgotten, say, you want to be removed. You want TFL to forget you. All that data, all these years it's been accumulating about you, you want it forgotten. So that would be a different and novel application of that, but those things will doubtless arise. Another aspect of this, however, is government uh, surveillance. And it turns out that, what well, doesn't turn out, it's simply a fact, that the Data Protection Directive has a very large hole in it, a deliberately created hole around national security and crime prevention, so that those principles, the Data Directive and the, the UK Act that implements it, don't in most circumstances apply to all the areas of national security and crime uh, uh, detection. So now, of course, you know that this uh, very month the Home Secretary has announced uh, the uh, introduced into Parliament the Investigatory Powers Bill, a major <coughs> new piece of legislating updating government powers of surveillance by public authorities. Those are powers to collect and process personal data, all of our personal data and also very extensive obligations on uh, not only your mobile phone provider, but all the web providers, including all the apps that you use, that they retain the data for 12 months. Everything you do should be held for 12 months, so it's potentially open to investigation. Here, the background on which this bill rests, and for all of us to think about, is not the data, uh, data Protection Directive in EU law, but it's the European Convention on Human Rights. So Article 8, the right to respect for private life. And so all these restrictions, including everything in relation to national security and crime prevention, and all the issues about uh, overextensive uh, intrusion into our lives, have to be tested as much as possible by principles of when they are necessary and they have to be proportionate, which will be a big part of the debate going on relating to the bill. So just the last thing to say here is, in light of what happened in Paris yesterday, I'll be thinking, well, actually, I rather like the idea that I don't live in an anonymous city. I like the idea that they track people as closely as possible. And certainly, we live in a society where there are obviously very high risks, risks that we didn't experience before. <clears throat> but one of the things I was looking at last evening was a comment by a fellow called Tim Hartford, who writes for the, uh, the Financial Times. He does uh, a lot of statistical work. He's quite a well-known commentator. 
And his comment on this, and I think it's the right one, is when we think of this, is the terrorist's best hope is to provoke an overreaction. We should not rush to think that the solution is the entire loss of our privacy, and that means the right to control our own information. There is a proportionate response, and we should all be concerned about what the proportionate and effective response is, and not simply, in a panic, throw away our privacy. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, so we are uh, Emily and Alan, and we are here partially um, because tomorrow is part of the uh, the weekend. Um, we're going to be teaching a, a privacy workshop um, and working with uh, with young people to sort of understand the implications of the the data that they share about themselves and and how they can better um, learn to control this. But I think as well. Data and working with data comes into uh, a lot of the work that we do on a personal and professional level. So we think it is an incredibly important topic um, at this point in time. I think some interesting stats. Uh, of all the data ever created in history, 90% was generated in the last two years. Um, the Internet of Things is on the ever increase. It's going to be 26 billion devices uh, on the Internet by 2020. Um, and I think one of the key questions um, that we need to ask is uh, how you know how can we actually start to use this data to improve people's quality of life so how, how can this become a, a positive thing um, and not something that uh, is, is the domain of um, the people who are experts at using it and use it without uh, without our consent and without our knowledge of what they're doing um, so I think we do a diverse kind of uh, work between us, but I think if you had to boil it down to, to one point, it would be we're interested in how we can use this data to empower people, um, and by people we mean sort of the non-experts, um, and make it useful for everyone, and then sort of democratize um, the, the way data is used, um, and uh, sort of increase that data literacy um, for everyone, so we all have a much more kind of shared understanding um, of how these things are being used um, and in what ways. Um, so how I kind of got involved uh, in this, uh, I'm a uh, designer um, by background, so I worked on a lot of kind of physical installations, um, sort of di digital installations, um, and uh, it was just interesting over the course of my career over the last 10 years, um, more and more uh, sort of brands and, and um, sort of organizations became interested um, in data and the way that they could use data sort of as, as marketing tools and uh, um, uh, as ways of um, kind of promoting uh, their own interests. So uh, data visualization became a really kind of key uh, skill or requirement for a lot of the work um, that I was doing as a designer. Um, and for the last two years, um, I've been working as design lead in the Future Cities Catapult. Um, and for those of you that don't know about the, the catapults, they're a partially funded um, set of government organizations um, looking to um, enhance innovation in different uh, different industries, um, so renewable energy, uh, sort of, uh, cell therapies, etc. And in my case, um, future cities. Um, and as part of future cities, um, I lead the design side of what we call the lab and innovation team. So we're a team inside of the catapult, and we're built out of a, a really diverse set of skills. Um, so we work with service designers, digital designers, um, insights experts who, and anthropologists who actually go out into the city to, um, to work with communities, um, data scientists, developers and creative technologists. And the idea is that hopefully by sort of looking at the data that we have available in cities and looking at the technologies that we have at our disposals, um, combining that with insights about what we know the challenges that people have in cities are, uh, we can start to use this um, in a much more effective way. I think a lot of times when people collect data in cities or, or, or develop technologies that then get implemented in cities, um, it's done 
um, in such a way that you know, of course, it's going to be a good thing if if we measure this uh, this um, aspect or we, we install this sensor, then that will tell us something really interesting. Before sort of having that thought of like, well, actually, why would we measure it? Um, what can we do with it once we have that data and not do it um, uh, on a a sort of quite an ad hoc basis. I think one of our kind of guiding sort of uh, motivations is uh, uh, sort of summed up by this quote by architect Cedric, uh, Cedric Price, which is technology is the answer, but what was the question? Um, and a lot of what we try and hopefully do is try and uncover what that question is so that when we do use this um, data and technology um, to, to enhance um, the way services are run in cities, that we're doing it with, a, with a, a real focus as to what will improve it for the people who live in them. Um, so a lot of what we actually do is, uh, as well as actually sort of looking at it from a much more technological perspective, is actually going out into the into the world. And this is a, a little glimpse of a, some service design we did around trying to improve the cycling experience um, in Milton Keynes, and actually going out and looking to uh, to find those challenge areas where we can hopefully have interventions through um, through some of this data. So I think actually, hopefully we have quite a unique perspective. So we really see it as this kind of what we call the blend of big data and rich data. So like through taking more qualitative um, data from working with people and communities um, and combining that with the big data, um, we can become a lot more targeted and a lot more effective um, in, in how we can apply it. So uh, there's a few projects which um, hopefully kind of get across how we, how we try and do this. Um, Sorry. Um, so, as the Future Cities Catapult, we do have access to a lot of um, a lot of data about the city. Um, and one of the things that we want to do, obviously, we want to not just innovate ourselves, but the whole point is to to um, spur innovation um, across the UK economy. Um, so, we developed, and it's been very early days if you go and check it out. But it's called the Urban Data Store, um, which is a bit of a forum for how we can um, how we can supply this data for people to take and use um, and come up with innovative ways um, of working. But prior to doing this, there are obviously, um, as I'm sure most of you know, a lot of things called data stores where people have data. They put it on the internet uh, under the assumption that someone will download it, turn it into an app or something interesting. Uh, and then that's kind of job done. And actually, I think the reality is when you look at it, a lot of data store, uh, sorry, a lot of um, applications of data in cities are things like transportation apps because they're quite useful, people need them, but they're also quite easy to do because it, transport data is relatively simple to come by because of the way that it's collected. Um, but given the amount of data that we do have in cities, actually a lot of that doesn't necessarily transform into innovations. And we wanted to look at how we could um, sort of unlock that a little bit more. So. We went out and uh, spoke to a lot of different what we call data users. Um, and when we say data users, we don't just mean the kind of people who are the data scientists and the developers who are already very savvy with data, but you know the person who runs a small business who has a sense that they might be able to use data in some way to support um, where they might open a new franchise, for example, um, uh, but they don't necessarily know how to do it. And I think one of the most interesting things that we found um, in doing this research is that often uh, when uh, governments and companies and, and, and places talk about data, they talk about it so much in terms of sectors. So the way someone would use health data um, is very different to how someone would use transport data. Um, when actually, when you start to look at those organizations, um, you get the whole spectrum of people, as you would expect, from the people who are incredibly comfortable in data to the people who have heard that it's a good thing and are really excited but actually don't know the first thing about where to start, to the people who look at data and they're just incredibly skeptical and they think um, any insight that you could get from analyzing data is no better than the, the sense that they get from their gut um, in, in terms of how they make decisions. And I think this is kind of a, a, a diagram that we do to kind of uh, sort of get across how we can start to, to, to develop <coughs> services that work for all of these people. And I think it's a really interesting thing because the difficult bit and the bit that's not really being addressed at the moment is, yes, we're, we're opening data and it is getting turned into to applications and services, but there's this whole kind of middle chunk which is being missed out at the moment slightly. So how do you turn that uh, data into the tools and the services and the education and the community engagement um, to get people uh, sort of on, on the same level with data, not just leave it to the experts who know what they're doing, but actually start to try and level that playing field um, and build um, that uh, sort of common ground so that people can start to engage. Um, 
and in terms of the urban data store, what that eventually ended up turning into is not just a data store where you come along and download the data and hopefully turn it into something, but actually much more kind of tutorial based, much more um, uh, education based. So using things like uh, code examples and code snippets um, to, to help people actually not just download the data, but actually give them the tools they need to, to quickly interrogate it, find out if it's the kind of data that they need um, and hopefully turn it into, um, into something, something useful. Um, another project that we worked on um, about a year ago now, which was quite interesting, was it, it was almost sort of an aspirin looking for a headache in a way. It was, it was a question that's looking at what kind of data do we have in cities um, and what other uses can that be um, put towards. So it was, a, it was an internal project, so it never actually um, really turned into, into anything in particular. But uh, what we did was we got as much data as we could off the London Data Store. Uh, ran it through some machine learning algorithms and created what we called whereabouts, which were these eight clusters of London uh, where um, the data was kind of self-similar. Um, and I think what was interesting, if you can see the picture behind that, um, sort of, there's almost this kind of concentric pattern that we found in the data. I mean, I think it, it, there's many other ways that we could have cut it, and this isn't sort of a de facto, like this is exactly how London looks um, diagram. But it was interesting to start to see how that data um, how that data looked when you analysed it and, and started to classify it into these different um, into these different categories, um, and I think part of that uh, was you know a to look at this data that we're not using and see if we can actually start to find any other uses for it. So there was sort of questions that we threw up around: could this help um, councils better allocate funding? So rather than sort of siloing their budgets um, inside themselves, actually uh, an area in Croydon is possibly similar to an area in Hackney, so is there any um, uh, any use for sort of looking at how they could share services or share budgets across uh, what they know about the demographics that live in them, live in those areas. But I think another key part of it was actually to be able to make this replicable, so if you do go to the website you'll see the, the, the code, the, the design um, has all been sort of open source and is all available for people to take um, to look at how we did and what we did it and hopefully improve on it and uh, make it more relevant. And uh, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to skip over the third project uh, and let M talk for once. Excellent. It's normally the way around. Um, so, hello, I'm Emily, or M, um, and I do I do a few things actually. So, I generally describe myself as an artist, researcher, educator. So, my work all revolves around making technology more accessible to people. So, I'm currently um, currently studying for a PhD at the Open University, looking at um, how electronic textiles can be used for blind and visually impaired people, and how they can actually work with the technology themselves to make little interactive interfaces, such as weaving would be textiles to make um, haptic uh, swatches. Um, I also run um, an arts and technology education company with Becky Stewart and we're called Co-Design and our work is all about getting people to use digital tools in the same way that you might use paint or photography so anything else um, but working with things like physical computing or um, perhaps more craft based practices so using things like conductive paint um, and I'm just going to talk briefly about a project which we worked on over the summer um, which was um, funded by Foundation for Future London and um, Space, the arts organisation, got us involved with it. Um, and it was called Data Explorers, and it was all about working with young people in Hackney um, to teach them about how to be more data literate. You know, I think I think we talk a lot about you know um, young people being um, in danger of leaking data. I think I mean I think everyone's in danger of knowing that. I, uh, uh, a lot of people I know who who perhaps don't always think about their data and how it's being used is actually. Um, you know, perhaps relatives or friends that are not just children. Um, but the whole idea of this was teaching young people about data, how can you collect data, what does it mean to work with data, how do you analyse data? You know, I think a lot of um, young people are taught about maybe how to visualise it in school, but what does it mean to actually take it apart and to look at it and then perhaps use it a bit more critically? Um, so this project took, por um, took part in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Um, the young people worked with Raspberry Pis, um, so they worked with, um, with um, sensors so they could collect temperature data, they could collect humidity and they could also look at location data as well. So what it meant to actually build their own data device from scratch, which was pretty cool, but actually what does it mean to go around and collect this? Um, but also um, looking at um, I guess more kind of observational data as well. So, kind of you know thinking about um, ideas around psychogeography. So you know looking at you know, how many flowers do you see, what kind of sounds do you hear in the park, and just really thinking about what the park meant to them through this process. A lot of these kids 
you know, live really close to that location, but don't always think it's for them. You know, they don't even know they can go into it. So for a lot of them, it was their first time there. So it wasn't only about collecting data around the park and then um, actually visualizing it, which I'll go on to in a minute. It was very much about, you know, opening up a space, which perhaps they hadn't been in before. Um, so we basically went through the process of, of, of going through all the data which they had um, collected through their forms, through the Raspberry Pis, um, and then we looked at different ways of visualizing it. You know, I think that a lot of kids and young people, when they think about data, they think about it as just being numbers or in a certain way that might come across as perhaps dry. So the idea was to make data quite exciting, actually, and look at different ways that you might visualize it. So not just in a bar chart or a pie graph or you know something like that. So. Um, we actually went through and we actually did uh, drawings with them. We worked with the artist uh, Stephanie Pozovec, who actually made a, a really cool visualization at the end of all of the kids' data which they had collected. And we actually got the young people to think about different ways you might visualize data in different representational forms. Um, this also included physical representation, so actually getting a map of the Olympic Park and looking at different areas which they had gone to and using things like pipe cleaners and foam to actually represent an experience or something which they'd actually found. Um, so this is uh, the final piece by Stephanie. So we went, we went to about six schools actually on this project and she basically collated all their data and created this visualization which would put up on the hoardings there. It might actually still be there, so if anyone goes through the Olympic Park regularly, go and, go and have a look. Um, but I think what was wonderful about this project was just to kind of, you know, get the kids to, to actually just think about data in a more critical way and how it is something which they can, you know, like, you know which they could collect themselves. It's not something which they should um, just kind of know exists but not really be aware about. Um, and then, as Al was saying earlier, we're going to be running a workshop tomorrow together um, about data privacy as well. So, yeah, and I think um, hopefully it's going to be sort of quite a sort of visual experience. And you know, as much as we we will be talking about sort of data privacy issues, I think hopefully what we'll be doing as well is kind of demystifying and unpacking what data actually is, and and sort of getting across that sense that it is potentially something that you can take control and ownership of. Um, uh, as well as sort of considering how, how it might be used. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have um, literally just noticed on the program we have intervention. intervention. <laughs> program, program intervention. You must be Phoebe. I'm Phoebe, thank you. Uh, you I'm look like you're to about to okay. intervene. So. Thank you very much. Um, I won't take up too much time. But here I am to intervene. Is this connected to the internet? Yeah, yeah, or not? yeah. yeah. No, I think okay. so. Well, I thought I would do. And thank you very much, actually, Philip and Irina invited me to come and give a presentation here today. And I appreciate that invitation very much. I've got an overlapping commitment, unfortunately. So I wasn't able to offer a full presentation. But um, I'll just speak for a couple of minutes uh, to say the project that I've been working on. So what I'm going to do is just bring up, actually, my blog. So I will just kind of give you some tasters. Um, of the work that I'm doing, and then if you want to read more or contact me, obviously you can. Uh, what I'm going to do is look for yeah. my blog. Okay. Okay. Write the address there. Uh, I can't up. actually see it. <coughs> if you write the... Can you write the address? <laughs> That's okay. Oh. oh okay, yeah. Let's bring it up. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um. She's saying Bing. <laughs> actually worked on my brain. Um, okay, so maybe I'll bring this one up. But anyway, blah, 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 developing first class. Okay, okay. Um, right. So as I say, just to, to give you a few sort of tasters of the work that I'm doing, um, um, I'm really interested in the implications for introducing wearables and self-tracking te technologies in the workplace. Um, and what that means for the employment relationship, oh, what that means for the employment relationship, can you hear me? <laughs> On the one hand, you have potential dark side, so there are questions to do with monitoring um, and what your employer can now know about you uh, via specific technologies that are worn on the body as well as embedded in your computer. Um, questions around opting in, opting out, uh, questions around can you make that kind of choice? What is that relationship? Um, but then on the other hand, at another extreme, there's a well-being initiative that's being rolled, there, there are well-being initiatives that are being rolled out. So actually, 
ABI research uh, demonstrates, predicts actually that 13 million uh, wearable fitness devices will be implemented into companies um, by 2019 and the latest data shows 10,000 companies offered fitness trackers in 2014 for employees. Now this is led by companies such as BP America and Autodesk um, and it's clearly something that can be explored. It's, a, it's seen as innovation. Why? Because one employee can create more than 30 gigabytes of data per week based on three wearable devices. So this is clearly a huge amount of information that can be uh, captured, stored, and analyzed as some Goldsmiths researchers found out last year. Um, they can learn how human behaviors that are measured by wearables and self-tracking technologies impact productivity, performance, well-being, and of course job satisfaction. So now the technologies are worn on wrists, if you, anyone in here has a Fitbit, set within fabrics, sewed under skin. Devices also take the form of wearable cameras, taking location-specific location specific pictures, or lanyards and badges that generate a social sensing platform across users. So what these technologies do is they measure and track arousal and performance, both uh, physical and potentially increasingly mental. We've already talked about psychological today um, and how this works via accelerometers, Bluetooth, triangulation algorithms, infrared sensors. And what this potentially means um, is that employers can monitor you beyond the enclosures of specific workplaces and beyond traditional hours logged. And what, the way that I'm researching it is really to look at the potentials for what it means uh, theoretically, because obviously I am an academic, and so my research uh, looks at new materialism in this context, um, demonstrating workers are being asked to measure our own productivity in a sense, as well as our health and well-being in art houses and warehouses alike, in both the global north and global south. We are experiencing intensified precarity, austerity, intense competition for jobs, anxieties about the replacements of labor power with robots and other machines as well as others other humans as it were so we've internalized the imperative to perform which is what i call a subjectification process as we become observing entrepreneurial subjects and observed objectified laboring bodies so through the implications of the use of wearables and self-tracking technologies in workplaces what i'm looking at is uh, the way that that the new ways of measuring our work uh, potentially lead to a heightened Taylorist influence on precarious working bodies within neoliberal workplaces. I don't think I'm going to go into a lot of depth, but my research looks again at Global North, Global South. The project that I have a grant for right now, I'm working with a company in the Netherlands. Now clearly there are legal dimensions to the work that's being done. This has to do with data protection. This has to do with again opting in, opting out. So what I'm looking at, I work actually in a law school, but I do international politics and industrial relations and so on. So my interest really is in these areas. So I'm working with a company, as I say, in the Netherlands, uh, which is conducting an experiment um, that is uh, rolling out Fitbit devices and a dashboard that, that each employee has to, uh, to track their productivity as well as other aspects. So um, a, a, what is it called, like a, a life logging, a daily kind of recording of their well-being and so on, and so that they can make links across uh, health, steps, well-being, stress, fitness, productivity. That's my intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, folks, we've got a few minutes. We started a bit late. My timekeeping was terrible, but we have got a bit of time for discussion. So, um, there's so many things raised. I don't think we can grab you with all of that. But anything you'd like to ask or comment on? Yeah, I want to talk to, uh, I forgot the name of the first talker, because that's what happens, isn't Nick. it? If you get the Nick. first thing. Mm. No. Uh, last year, I just, there's a couple of questions, but I might just uh, put it down to one. Uh, so you basically you've got Karen, which is like a virtual data body, and uh, I just wanted to kind of understand where do you think the emancipation uh, uh, of the person who interacts with Karen takes place? Yeah, so I guess... Um, As in real emancipation, where do you think, other than, other than when the service itself is much more kind of like a colonial relationship, where do you think the actual user takes control of the project in some way? Where could it go in that sense? Well, I guess it's... Um, originally, we'd set out to make something where we really... Um, 
engaged with the complexity of data and with, with the complexity of profiling what and what's plausible or what's doable with that so that we really wanted to make a piece of work where we felt like we knew our audiences again in a way that we used to know when we made work that existed in a single place and so the goal was in a way to make something where actually even if we didn't know you personally the work somehow knew you and would inveigle itself and become intimate with you but that's not emancipation Exactly, and I think what, what, what then came out was we realised that's actually very difficult, that we didn't have the skills to deliver that. And so I think, or I hope, that we, what we made was actually more of a parable. It's very, it's very simple in terms of its data use. We're not actually doing a huge amount with your personal data or doing anything that clever. But our goal is to actually, to, was more to create a parable about data, so that in, in the course of the story, you start to learn about the things that you are giving away, and you start to learn about... Um, what she might be able to le learn about you or the things she might be able to exploit about you if she was a real person, but she's actually a fictional person. So there's that side of it within the story, but then there's also a side of it in the, in the data report at the end where we, we try and actually, uh, I guess, de deconstruct what happened a little bit and also talk about the uses of the data, like the dimensions that we use, like, like the psychometric profiling dimensions that we use and how they've been used in other contexts. So I, I think there's that two sides, I think. Is that emancipation? No, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> okay. I think, I think emancipation probably would look by, I think that's probably more educative, but uh, in a kind of virtual sense uh, or uh, surface sense. <laughs> but uh, I'd say uh, a good example, for instance, would be if there was a license issued uh, where people can understand where that data that's been kind of experimented with issues for the kind of the choice of licenses of the data that you've that you've actually given to the service itself. So in other words, you can offer a choice within that process where the person can experience the process of emancipation with data at the same time, rather than where they're kind of not a rat, but a more kind of where the in other words, where they're claiming some control of the process. Yeah. And, and I think a license is just a very small start where, in other words, where you can say, do you want, how do you want this license uh, to uh, create affect for yourself? And, and where do you want, and, and give a choice of what those licenses are just through that process. That's just one example. Yeah. Okay, before you come back again, any other questions or questions? Yes, back. A uh, question for, uh, for Anne and Al. I'm just curious about the, the virtue of tomorrow. Uh, to what extent uh, are you going to teach the use of Tor? And to what extent do you think uh, privacy tools like that have a place in, in sort of com commonplace internet? Um, we will briefly touch on Tor. Um, it's it's quite a short workshop, so we're sort of limited in terms of what we can go into. So uh, the, the primary focus of it is going to be around sort of visualization tools and starting to unpack and sort of look at discussions around the data that um, that is available and trying to look at the implications um, of that. <coughs> um, sorry, I've forgotten the second part of your question. Well, to, to what extent do you, do, do you have a sense that uh, a, a tool like Tor Particularly, so we, we just had the rundown of, of recent history of, of changes in legislation, and that that, that changes, uh, hopefully, that affects the, the choices we make and, and, and the tools we use to, to, to move around uh, online. So I, I, I was curious, because you're, uh, you're teaching a workshop, to what do you extent do you think tools like Tor uh, have importance in, in commonplace use? Um. I think it's. Uh, I think it's all sort of. Uh, it's all very important. I think it's. It's important to kind of explore as many of these different avenues. I think it's only by kind of engaging with them that you really we can start to like understand the um, the full implications um, <coughs> of what it is that we're doing. And I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a sort of uh, definitive answer for that really, but I think. Um, I think there is value in exploring exploring all of these different um, different things and trying to trying to understand the reach. Um, that the data can have and um, just make that as, as apparent as possible and I think yeah tools like, like Tor and, and those sorts of things do definitely go towards um, sort of exploring that. Yeah, if you're interested we're very happy to share the kind of workshop outline with you and can talk about it later maybe after after the talk just so we can share knowledge a bit more. Um, thank you. Um, 
thank you very much. I, I have a question for um, Perry and Heller, uh, but also it probably applies to everybody on the panel. So I thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. And we can suggest though at the end that we need to accept the fact that we are going to lose um, anonymity. Um, um, anonymity. <coughs> that, that can be okay as long as we assert our rights. And my question, I suppose, is how do we get people to, and when I say, I mean about others, I mean about myself, well, how do we encourage people to assert their rights? Um, and and to, how do we turn to complacency? Because, and um, how do we raise awareness? Because all those things are really important, but also accepting our rights requires a, a, quite a, a big investment of um, energy and, and time and interest, and as you said, very often we'll stick to all the small, um, you know, writing and just say agree, uh, so we can go and use the app or whatever it is to make it that easier. So how do we, how do we challenge that and ask you? Right, well, that's a, that's a wonderful question, and uh, I, I, I think, you know, you put on uh, your finger what, what some people have called uh, normalizing surveillance. He says we're just just drifting into this, and it just becomes normal to accept this. A lot of it is I imperceptible to us, even as it as it happens around us in all these different and new ways. And we also like all the conveniences it provides us with. Um, so I think that is an enormous challenge. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it's possible for people just to give up on that. But I I, I do think that we are reaching a critical time where it's, it is so pervasive and people have the sense of it happening in their own lives and incidents happen and suddenly jolting people. So I, I just, uh, in terms, I can't give you a solid, you know, there's an organization that we all ought to join. There are many available uh, around, various organizations working on this, but I do feel hopeful that people, anybody you talk to has had some experience where they're alarmed at the way their data has been put together, something uh, product is being pushed at them in a very uh, targeted way in which is drawn on our previous profiles. So I'm horrified to see what advertising is. Anyone else like to uh, respond on this point about how do we... Well, I think the, the thing that sort of came up when you talk about data literacy and from our experiences of making work that uses data, it's just the challenge of of sort of understanding like the issues and the complexity of it. So for for people to understand, you know, what are the potential issues of of sharing their data or how they're doing that um, requires quite a lot of specialist knowledge about the workings of the internet and the, and the architectures of like servers and how organizations are sharing data in the background, like what cookies do, like who fuck who knows what cookies do? I don't know. I don't know what cookies do. Um, so, but, and all of that stuff is 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 a very specialist knowledge. And I, so, I, I don't feel it's at all optimistic that we will be in a position to understand that in a way that we will be able to, you know, campaign or legislate in our own interests, because we just don't. We, we're not in a position to to you know we don't have that time to spend learning that stuff. So, I don't know. And just to add on this a little bit, um, with regards to our um, ability to sort of determine or have a, a certain kind of right uh, regarding the information about us. Um, so, when it comes to data literacy and um, the differential ability each of us have to, um, to sort of uh, tactically um, <laughs> decide about in where information about them goes or what sort of memories are kept. Uh, and what can be forgotten or not ever revealed. Um, so we are faced in a, we have a situation that develops where, yes, those who can use this knowledge, mobilize this knowledge, I mean, the kind of gaps between people and discrimination get deeper, if not wider. So it becomes more and more, if, if, if it becomes more specialized. So my question is, are there any two, any models that you have um, been using in your research? Because I haven't read about personal data, for, 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 well I'm not a specialist in the area, that you would uh, suggest when it comes to, because um, uh, I did like the idea of, uh, of, of limiting the purpose 
of information, so purpose limitation. Uh, so how, how data can be. Don't respond to that yet because I can see there's more hand. And now, of course, everyone wants to talk. <laughs> now, now we're at the end, we've run out of time. Everyone's got the hand up. So, one here, but one at the back first. Yes, you. Thanks. Um, I'm Jack, sort of responsible for creating new technologies that really go on the research. And I just find a lot of millions of euros for doing research into um, how innovation is developed through create, sustained creativity. So, we're doing six years of research into creativity, and one of the things I found was the relationship between freedom and anonymity. <coughs> And notice that people are more creative, obviously, with uh, more freedom than they've got as well. Um, but free will is a big thing that's a part of that uh, sense of agency. And I just wanted to ask the panel opinions on what their experience is of the link um, between free will or freedom uh, and people actually being able to be creative and make a difference and do something a little bit different with their lives. Okay, and then, yes? Um, I was just wondering what the panel thinks about, um, you know, we've got regulation in the, uh, in the European Union, America, in the UK, but generally, internationally, people are cre collecting data, and it, it is somewhere, and I, I don't know whether quite a lot of other countries might not have the same regulations that we have, but then they also have the same access if they know how to do it, if that makes sense. Uh, in, in what, how do we protect that? How do we protect our privacy, you know, in a kind of open source, open data world? You put the nail on that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so some couple of e easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, whoever would like to respond, really. I can take the second one. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> um, <coughs> Um, well, I was going to say, with um, specifically with the whole genome sequencing stuff, um, I know what they're doing in the UK is building, they looked at doing it in cloud computing, but then they realised that they lose um, control over the data and then they lose ownership of the data. So in terms of data security, because the weird thing about sort of sequencing data is that we don't know what it's telling us yet until we do the research to understand it better. So we're gonna, it's, it's data about us um, that we don't fully understand the implications of yet. So they're very careful about who has access to that. And I, I know Public Health England princes are building vast uh, server storage kind of data storage areas I mean huge um, that we've actually got to go and visit um, and they have levels of trust access so they want researchers to be able to access the data but they want it to be an anon anonymized no what's the anonymized thank you uh, <laughs> it's very early for me I've got a bit of jet lag uh, and uh, so they're um, so they're you know, certain researchers can only access the data at certain levels, but they had to take it all out of cloud computing because they wanted to keep access to it. Okay. Can I respond to the free will and creativity? So I guess the, the, the one point which I thought was interesting from your smart cities was to do with this fact that we've not somehow had an anonymity and agency and then suddenly become constrained by surveillance. It's not been like a sort of downward path. I think that's, for me, like these structures have kind of affordances which allow you to do certain things. And the thing that's changed is that the anonymity has changed in that you're just who knows you and how they know you has changed. And so that means the affordances it gives you as to what you feel capable of doing have changed. Um, um, sorry, it's, it's very abstract, but I, I guess, um, yeah, technology has its kind of own affordances, I guess, in terms of creativity. Just to uh, throw in one thing is on the uh, the transfer of data internationally. Uh, although there are is the one caveat is is everything's leaky and and um, uh, there are limitations on what the law can do. But nonetheless, one can see how the Schrems decision, very recent Schrems decision, European Court of Justice says. The Safe Harbor Agreement, which is trans so much of our data, Google, Facebook is being transferred to the states, that's invalid. 
because behind that, the American government has pretty well open access and unrestricted access to European personal data in a way that they are not allowed to do that with American citizens. So we're in the aftermath, and I saw this week, this past week, Microsoft says, well, one of the ways they think the only thing they can do is to uh, establish in Germany uh, servers to contain European personal data there, but actually they have to put it under the control of um, Deutsche uh, Telekom, because if it was still under their control, they could be legally required by the American government to give them access. So they'd have to not only have it physically kept here, but at the same time, they'd have to have some lock so that they couldn't get access to it. But it is a very direct consequence uh, of that important decision that something like Microsoft and other companies are thinking that they have to start keeping European personal data in Europe and, and not putting it in the cloud or transferring it otherwise uh, out of Europe. So, the, you know, in, in a messy situation, there are some <laughs> glimmers of, of uh, yeah, but constructive development. <laughs> but we also know that storages are in Hong Kong, in Australia, and all, you know all that kind of transferable data. But there are legal requirements yeah. that restrict when you can transfer. And as yeah. I say, it's leaky. But nonetheless, this is an instance where they're saying legally we just cannot be transferring this data from Europe to America. We need another solution. Okay, slightly marginally optimistic note to end. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, well, we're going to reconvene in here at two and continue this discussion, a new panel, some new presentations, uh, but for now we can discuss it informally over lunch. Thanks again to the panel.